Good evening. Uh, again, this is Sean Hall. I'm the president of the Life and Breath Foundation, and we'd like to welcome you to the speaker series. Um, this is something that we are really excited about being able to share information from various guest speakers from all over the United States. And tonight's topic is ocular sarcoidosis, how to diagnose, treat, and improve care. Uh, I'd like to run through a couple things, little uh, housekeeping measures. So if we could go to the next slide, um, why we exist. As the founder of the Life and Breath Foundation, I was challenged. I lost my mother in 1996 uh, with sarcoidosis, decided I wanted to do something uh, for patients uh, that had the same struggle she did, making sure we can share information, the latest and greatest. So I established the Life and Breath Foundation. And our primary goals in terms of why we exist today is to offer the sarcoidosis community effective tools to track their journey, decipher medical issues, and to maximize the quality of life. We also would like to do that in a nurturing environment, especially for those that are affected by sarcoidosis so that they could share their experiences. We really don't want you to think that you're by yourself. Uh, you're being supported by caregivers, family members, things of that nature. We welcome them into the community also. We want to provide this opportunity to share in this environment because that's what we need. People need to listen and understand the plight and what you're going through. Uh, we, we think that we can build an awareness within the medical community also to help combat this chronic disease. Hence, we bring in speakers and try to uh, communicate with them, try to understand how we can do it better and naturally become an advocate for you. Um, okay, we'll go to the next slide. I'd like to introduce Dr. Megan Birkenstock. She's an associate professor of ophthalmology at the Wilmer Eye Institute at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. She is a U Uvitis specialist, I didn't say that right, UVA, Uvitis specialist at the Wilmer Eye Institute, including over 300 patients with sarcoidosis and eye involvement. Her research involves quality improvement initiatives and understanding barriers to care in patients with uveitis. Got it right. Um, <laughs> fantastic. Uh, so before Dr. Birkenstock uh, takes over, I wanted to read uh, a little disclaimer. Uh, this webinar uh, will not be given medical advice. There's no doctor-patient relationship being established by Dr. Birkenstock during this meeting. Uh, Dr. Birkenstock doesn't know your medical background and can therefore not give you medical advice. Speak with your doctor before acting on any information you hear this evening. Dr. Birkenstart, welcome to the speaker series for the Life and Breath Foundation. Well, thank you, Dr. Hall, for having me. It's nice to be back. Um, and I'm really excited to share some of the new things we're going to be doing um, at our UVITIS clinic. I'm trying to get it to... Uh, Go forward, there we go. So I'm gonna go over uh, a few parts of ocular sarcoid and then also what we're doing in our clinic. So how does sarcoid cause inflammation in the eye? What are some treatments that we can do to take care of it? And finally, how are we trying to serve you better as uveitis specialists to improve the quality of care for sarcoid patients in our specific eye clinic? So let's start with the eye anatomy because I find that's always the most challenging when you're presented with eye complications. Well, what, where is where where is the complication? So let's go from there. So if you all can see my my mouth in the front of the eye is is the cornea and um, that's where keratitis or inflammation can happen. Behind it is the iris, blue, green, brown doesn't matter. It's just the muscle that opens and closes, and that's where the iris is, and that's hence the term iritis if you ever hear that or anterior uveitis. So anterior means front of the eye between the cornea and the lens, and the lens is what becomes our cataract as we age when it becomes cloudy. Then when you go behind that, there's a big dense gel ball in the back of the eye called the vitreous. So if there's inflammation there, that's called vitritis or intermediate uveitis because it's the middle part of the eye. 
And then in the back, we have the white of the eye, which is called the sclera. So you might have scleritis or inflammation of that. And underneath it is this little brown layer called the choroid. And that abuts next to the little sliver here that looks pan colored. And that's the retina. Then you can have a chorioretinitis in the back or posterior uveitis because it's in the back of the eye. So if your doctor ever uses those terms, that's exactly what you should be asking questions about. And then finally, the optic nerve is the cable between the eye and the brain. And if that gets inflamed, that's an optic neuritis. And then finally, there's muscles around the eye that can get inflamed or in the orbit or eye socket. So you might hear orbital inflammation. And then finally, the lacrimal duct um, and the lacrimal gland are also up here in where the eye socket would be. So then that can be also inflamed. And we'll talk about that later. So in sarcoid, the eye is one of the most commonly affected organs. And like I said, we can have a granulomatous uveitis. So just like the granulomas that you can form in your lungs, we actually see them in the eye because we're one of the few places in the body where you can actually see into. And I'll show you some pictures of that. You can get an inflammatory glaucoma with all the inflammatory cells circulating around your eye, the drains in the eye that lead the fluid that the eye makes to nourish itself out. The drainage canals can become blocked. The optic nerve can be inflamed like we talked about already. The sclera, that white connective tissue layer can become inflamed. And then finally, the lacrimal gland, which makes your tears, can become inflamed granulomas form. And then you don't make tears anymore. So your doctor may say Sika syndrome or dry eyes and dry mouth. Secondary uh, Sjogren's syndrome um, is secondary to the sarcoid as opposed to Sjogren's syndrome just being your only diagnosis. So primary would be if Sjogren's syndrome was your diagnosis, secondary, if it's secondary to another disease, here's sarcoid. So here are the granulomas. Um, in chest x-rays, you can see large lymph nodes, but here in the eyes, this is the cornea, like I, I mentioned before, and then you can see these little dots. The ophthalmologists really like to eat, and for somebody, they said, this looks like mutton fat. Like, I've never seen cheap fat, but apparently that's what this looks like. And they're greasy and they're stuck on, and this means that the entire anterior chamber is inflamed, and notice the red eye that you're seeing, and also behind here, which is deep to what you're looking at, the iris, is starting to make abnormal connections to the lens behind it. So if you ever hear us say synechia to you, it just means abnormal connections between two pieces of the body that shouldn't be. These are what we call snowballs. Again, ophthalmologists, really creative people here. It looked like snowballs. And I'm, pre, I, I'm apologizing that it's grainy, but what you're seeing are little connections of cells clumped together, floating in that vitreous gel in the back of the eye. And you can tell because there's a little bit of a uh, shadow behind them on the overlying retina. When the vitreous becomes inflamed, these snowballs float around the back of the eye and looks like a snow globe. Sometimes the veins in the back of your eye and sarcoid can get inflamed. And when we look in, all of the proteins inside of them start to leak out. And then they start to make this orange covering to or sheathing to the veins. And so somebody thought this looks like candle wax dripping off the top of a candle. So these are candle wax drippings or, or venous inflammation. And this is what a, a normal optic nerve looks like in the back. Again, ophthalmologists like to eat. This looks like a perfect donut, like a nice glazed donut with a nice teeny little donut hole and an intact rim, no bites out of it. That's what you want to see when you look in the back and you're the ophthalmologist. Sometimes when people have sarcoid, they can make granulomas in the optic nerve. And literally, you will see the granuloma when you look in the eye. And it distorts where the vessels come in and it makes all this inflammatory debris and elevation in the back. But if you take steroids, it goes away. This is the biggest one I think we've ever seen in our clinic. Um, and you can see just how large it is. It's almost like a cloud coming up from the back of the eye. And just to prove that, we do ultrasounds of eyes. And you can see how it literally is raised. If this is the front of the eye that we're ultrasounding, and this is the back, and that's the nerve, that's the cable to the brain, you can see it's a, a huge lump coming up. Sometimes we can have granulomas that we see on the sclera. If the sclera is, uh, or the white part of the eye is inflamed, and you see that here with the beefy red vessels surrounding it, and that can be very painful. So how do we deal with all these places in the eye that get inflamed? Well, if you have dry eye syndrome, your doctor can use a stepladder approach. We normally start with artificial tears, which are over the counter. You've heard of them on TV, like sustain or refresh. And um, you can use them up to four times a day. And if they're preservative free, as many times a day as you'd like. 
we sometimes put plugs in. So it's just like you're putting a stopper in a drain in your tub when if you're going to take a bath. So we put the punctal plug right in the duct that goes from the eye surface down into the nose to drain your tears. So that way your tears can't leave and they stay in the eye surface for longer. So that's another option. They're called punctal plugs. And then um, we can ratchet up our strategy. So if those aren't working and you're still having irritation, redness, dry, scratchy feeling, your eyes feel tired, you blink, and then it's great for two minutes and then you're back to feeling the same way, we can start to give you cyclosporin or lithograph. Those are trade names, uh, Restasis or Zydra, and they're dosed twice a day. And then if that doesn't work, we can make compounded stronger formulations like tacrolimus or cyclosporin. There's a new nasal spray out, varenicline. For those of you who are former smokers, you know it as Chantix. Well, a pharmaceutical company repurposed it as a nasal spray and it makes you tear. I don't know how they figured it out. I asked the man who designed it, it's amazing. And so one spray in both, in both nasal passages once a day and you make more tears. So that's the new kit on the block that is not an eye drop for those who are sick of peppering things into their eyes. And finally, scleral lenses. So they are like contact lenses like you would be fitted for, but they're larger. So they fit over the white of the eye. So they literally trap tears over your surface. And so um, they prevent evaporation. And now what do we do if your sclera is inflamed? Well, the first thing we start off with are non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. So NSAIDs for short. They're our first line treatment and uh, we can either use flurbiprofen, which is our drug of choice because it's per the rheumatology literature has a little bit less of a side effect profile to the GI tract, but you could easily use ibuprofen like in your medicine cabinet, 800 milligrams three times a day. Um, normally we'll also give you an acid just so we don't give you an ulcer on top of everything else going on. And then we always check your creatinine to make sure that your kidney function stays the same um, before treatment and then during treatment, um, again, to make sure there's no changes. And then finally, uveitis. So how do, how do we deal with the beast? Uh, well, that's that's my whole lot in life right there. And what I do, especially if the inflammation is only in the front of the eye, is I start with topical steroids. And so our go-to is prednisolone acetate 1% with a slow taper over several weeks. We might ask you to start every hour, eight times a day, and then hopefully we could taper it down to two or less times a day, which has been shown to not cause cataracts. So the risk is zero per eye year. If you're taking lots of prednisolone and you're still not controlled, we can double down and go down to diflupredinate, trade name Durazol. It is two times as strong as prednisolone acetate, hence the doubling down. And then we can always try to get you back to prednisolone acetate. But if we're going with the Durazol, it's because either you're using it so much that you need something stronger, or it's just, frankly, we, we need something that penetrates the eye a little bit more because it's useful in patients with intermediate uveitis or inflammation in the middle of the eye. Sometimes those aren't enough or they can't touch the inflammation. So there's other things that we can use such as intravitreal injections or in the eye injections. We can also give subtenon or around the eye injections where we place a steroid that we inject and it slowly leaks out over six to 12 weeks and it lives in your eye socket and then the steroid is slowly released. So instead of you having to take drops all the time, or if we want to place the medication closer to where if you have swelling in the back of your eye and your retina, we can place it closer. And so some of the medications you might hear us talk about are Kenalog, almost like the Kenalog in your joint uh, that they might inject in your joints, but um, preservative free version. And then dexamethasone or flucinolone. And these are the implants. They come in the little pens and then we inject them in your eye. And then when we look in the back, we can see them floating around. And then they just slowly disintegrate and then turn in, some of them turn into carbon dioxide and water and just disappear. Sometimes those aren't enough. And those are your topical and your local treatments. So then we got to bust out the big guns. And that's the oral steroids and immunomodulating medication. So this would be something that if you have other organ systems involved, you guys already know well about. So oral steroids, prednisone, um, it's dirty, it's cheap, and it really works. So um, the only issue, as we all know, is it can cause a multitude of sins, including in the eye steroid responsive glaucoma or the formation or worsening of cataract over time. 
So what we do is we start big and then we try to taper you. And we start at usually 60 milligrams per day for two weeks. And then we get on to 40. And then after that, we have a regimented tapering scale. And we slowly try to taper you down to seven and a half milligrams daily or less over three months. And if we can't get there and your inflammation recurs, then we have to start something that is a steroid sparing agent, or if you can't tolerate the side effects. So that's when we start talking to you about other things like methotrexate, MTX for short, mycophenolate mofetil or Sulcept is the trade name. TNF alpha inhibitors um, are used off label unless there's uveitis in the eye, which then Humira is the only FDA approved medication for non-infectious uh, intermediate posterior and PN uveitis. So sometimes, like I said, despite our best efforts, we cause some problems or problems just arise from the disease. And that would be glaucoma or elevated eye pressure leading to visual field loss. It's usually treated topically with certain drops. Examples are here, like bromonidine with the purple cap. Latanoprost has a aqua cap. Similol is a yellow cap. And then dorazolamide has an orange cap. Whoever thought of making different color caps was a genius. <laughs> some of these names are really hard, but everybody always remembers their drop cap colors. And so in combination or used alone, it can lower your eye pressure. But unfortunately, 10 to 20% of patients still require surgery. And that's what I'm showing you down here in these photos. We have new techniques where we can use needles to open up the drainage canals, kind of like rotor rotor, if you will. And then we can also place stents in there to keep them open once we do rotor rotor. Or sometimes we're just like plumbers. If we can't get the drain open by roto rooting it, you bypass it or put in a new pipe. And that's exactly what we do down here. So some people end up with trabeculectomies where we filter the fluid from inside the eye underneath this bubble, which is just raised conjunctiva or the outer skin of the eye. And then the fluid drains into the veins around the eye. Or you can just do a tube. So put in the new pipe. There is a little drainage device here that sucks the fluid out of a little tube that's connected to inside of the eye. And then the tube shunt and uh, the receiving end are uh, attached to the eyeball. So that takes us into how can we improve care? I mean, we just talked about a lot of things here. We're talking about multiple medications that you have to take. You have to learn the directions on how to use all of them. We have to get prior authorizations for a lot of these medications, especially the immunotherapy medi or immunosuppressive medications. All of this requires a large cost in addition to just the premiums that you pay to have your insurance. Pharmacy availability has been a really big problem for us in the eye world because one of the major uh, drop manufacturers, Acorn Pharmaceuticals, went bankrupt. And so now we're having a shortage of our own drops that we use in the clinic, in addition to the ones that you guys take at home. So sometimes you may not be able to get the drug, even if you really need it. And finally, generic drugs are great because they're cheaper. And now we're moving into the world of biosimilars. So the biologic medications like Humira and Remicade are now becoming biosimilars. So there's generics and insurance companies love them because they're way cheaper because now these biologic medications went off of patent. So we know that you need medical advice and you need multidisciplinary care. So one of the things that we really care about is what's the accuracy of online information, and especially with bots online and the advances in AI, which I'll talk about, we want to know that if you're reading things online and you're Googling, are you getting the right uh, messages? And finally, Remembering appointment dates and times, it's hard. I'm a mother of four. Trying to remember where I'm supposed to be in a day, in addition to all my little people, is daunting. And when you have multiple cooks in your kitchen, including all your specialists that you have to see, it's a lot. And there's a lot of time and distance to travel to all of these clinic appointments. And sometimes if you have uveitis and you've had it for a while or it's been hard to control, you already, might already have poor vision. And so you may need to even add one more person to your wheelhouse, which is a low vision specialist. So these are things that we all know happen in our world and in your world to help make you be yourself and feel good in your own shoes. And so we wanted to know in each one of these bullets, how can we make things better and how can we understand what messages you're getting at home?
So we started to do some research in our clinic, and the first of which was cost-related barriers to care. I mean, cost comes with everything in life, right? And one of the things I really wanted to know, because a lot of times people are sheepish when they come in and talk to me. They don't want to tell me that, you know what, doc, I'm not taking my medications because I can't afford them. Or you know what? It was between getting my food or getting my Remicade this month, and I didn't have money to take the taxi over to the infusion center. And so what we did was we looked at a National Institute's database called All of Us Research Program. And what it is, is survey responses, and whether it's from patients or doctors, and it looks at the effect of race, gender, income, insurance type, and education level on the ability to afford medications. And so nobody's ever looked at this in patients with uveitis. And so these are some of the questions that it asked. During the past 12 months, was there any time you couldn't afford a prescription, you skipped a medication, took less, delayed filling one, ask your physician for a lower cost medication, you even had drugs shipped in from another country to save money, and did you use alternative therapies? So these are pressing questions that are happening in everybody's eye clinic. So what do we find for uveitis patients? Specifically, an annual income of less than 75,000 was more significantly associated with those than that made over 150 with affording medications, filling prescriptions, skipping doses, taking less medications, and exploring alternatives. Patients over 60 were more likely to report difficulty affording medication, and especially those without health insurance. And I can tell you, this covers a lot of the patients in my uveitis clinic. And now that we did the study, it gives me a way to approach the topic in a non-invasive way and say, hey, you know what, this is our research and this is what we found. And I have a little sign and I'm going to put it up in my little clinic office. And then hopefully it brings up this discussion. And not only that, but I know some of my patients, especially, like I said, with long-term disease, they need to see low vision specialists. And, and who are they? So they're folks who are um, either optometry trained or ophthalmology trained, and they provide techniques and devices to increase the ability to function and help you with quality of life by doing everyday tasks. So they're the folks who help you get white canes and um, seeing eye dog services through Lighthouse um, organization, and then also magnifiers and telescopic lenses. Some of these are not covered by insurance and some are, and they help you navigate through that, that space. What we did was we sent out a survey of 30 questions to members of my professional organization, which is the American UBI Society. So we collected the physician demographics of who responded, their patient population, so where are they located, criteria for low vision referrals, how familiar they are with these services, and what barriers do they see in sending folks over for these specialty care. So most doctors sent about one to five patients per month, and that just really hits home the point that you want your uveitis to be taken care of early and you want to be adequately treated because you don't want to get to this point. Low vision is considered 2200 or less. So that's the definition of legal blindness or your vision's within the 20 central 20 degrees of field. And so if we can get you away from that, that's what we want. We want you to see. But anybody with vision 20, 40 or less can also go see low vision. And I think that's one of the main perceptions we're trying to, to change is that if you think somebody is having a hard time with difficulties um, related to visual field loss or vision and you perceive that, send them. And one of the things that they found was that the cost of services and insufficient communication about patient experiences were the key barriers. So what we said is you, this is one thing we need to talk to our patients about when we when they come in. And then if you don't think about it, you don't diagnose it. That's what they tell you in medical school. And it's the exact same thing here with low vision. If you don't think about it and you don't talk about it, like, hey, you're a truck driver. How are, how, how are you able to function? Do you feel like you can see well? And it's not just about driver's licenses. It's about the ability to take care of yourself. So ask, that's what we learned. Do patients with uveitis need to spend more time with physicians? I make the argument, yes, but could I prove that? I had to. And so there was another national database where primary care physicians and other specialists entered in data over several years. And we found the diagnosis codes for anterior uveitis. And they were more likely to be non-Caucasian and visiting a physician's office due to a flare or treatment for a chronic medical problem. As we know, uveitis sometimes could be self-limited, but in 
a lot of cases, it is chronic. And so UVI special, uh, patients spent 2.5 minutes longer with their physician and African-American patients, privately insured, and patients with a new problem or who were post-surgical spent more time with their physician. And so this is something we took and we ran with because what we do is now when we book patients, we know you guys need more time. So we have more time. And it gives the physician that space to ask about low vision services. It gives the physician the space to talk about prescribing medications. We hear you loud and clear, and we are trying to understand what you need. Another issue is there's not a lot of us. I was, I was saying earlier, there's 200 UVI specialists in the entire country. And so it would be nice if we were all equidistant and spread out across the country, but some states don't even have one. So what is the travel time that a patient has to spend in order to come to see one of us? I mean, gosh, I get people from the surrounding five states. I mean, at least in the Northeast, the states are small, but I mean, if you live in Wyoming and you're going to Colorado, that's, that's a lot. So we looked at the travel time to the nearest UVI to specialist and in, in, in understanding how it impacts the access to care. And so what we did was we took all the addresses of uveitis trained specialists from our specialty, subspecialty websites, and then we plotted them on a map. And then we used a certain software to look at all locations within a 60 minute drive from each of our specialist locations. And if we had multiple locations, well, we plotted them all. And we looked at the total population, racial groups, poverty levels, and population of dependent groups. So those under 18 and those older than 65 and those with health insurance within and outside of that one hour area around each one of the locations. And what we found was there was a significant travel burden to the nearest specialist for most Americans. A significant number of specialists were mostly in metropolitan areas and only 63% of the United States population was within a service area. And those outside of the coverage areas, we're more likely to not have insurance, be Caucasian, have government-sponsored insurance, be in a federal poverty level, or be in a dependent age group. And so what we really wanted to put out there as a public service announcement to physicians, and we were just talking about how there aren't enough to begin with, let alone ophthalmologists and certainly not UVI specialists, but put out the importance of increasing the number of uv specialists in areas that fall out of existing coverage area. I'm so proud of our former fellow who moved to Montana. I thought, oh, you're going to be the only one in the state. Like, good for you. you. But this is what we need in rural areas to address the health crisis that is lack of providers in rural areas. And so another issue is always cost, right? Cost, cost, cost. It's the name of the game in life. And no studies ever looked at a way to limit healthcare costs associated with the treatment of uveitis. And rest in peace, I trained at Drexel Eye Physicians, which was an academic ophthalmology practice associated with a safety net hospital. So uh, a hospital that helps the under and non-insured patients with most of the population whom we took care of in Philadelphia. It, it, um, closed in 2019, and it was most of central Philadelphia's place to go if there was an emergency. With operating costs over reimbursements, Hahnemann had a monthly loss of three to five million dollars and it filed for bankruptcy protection. But before it was closed for good, we looked at the types of uveitis that were seen and what treatments were needed to control eye inflammation in this population. And we looked at ways to help patients. And what could we do to get the eye drops and use what copays they had to limit treatment costs? So of the eyes and patients that we took care of, 67% were African-American and most eyes were luckily treated with corticosteroid drops, but some patients still required immunosuppression. And nearly 80% of our patients depended to some extent on either Medicare or Medicaid assistance. This was novel. African-Americans were not the most common auto or group and sarcoid was not the most common autoimmune disorder in any previous uveitis study. We decreased our treatment costs by prescribing medications from patients' formularies. So if you don't know what's on your formulary, it's a good thing for you to look at because there may be an alternative to what your physician prescribed that might be covered and it's less coming out of your pocket. 
We enrolled in pharmaceutical company support programs. And finally, we partnered with Rheumatology and um, their version of the sarcoid clinic um, in order to obtain authorization because it, when they have an underlying autoimmune condition, ICD-9 code, it's a lot easier for the rheumatologist sometimes to get the medication, which has an FDA approval, as opposed to everything except for Humira, which for us is considered off-label. So what are we doing now? Well, we've made some strides, but oh, there's so much more we need to know. The first of which was helpfulness of the after visit summary. You know, you always get those papers when you check out at the doctor's office and you're like, oh, let's just throw this in the bin. Well, we want to know if we write things in there like, oh, maybe you should taper your eye drops and this is how you should do it. Then will you read it? We want to know. And so inquiring minds are going to figure this out. Not only that, but we also want to know what barriers to care are there across the United States. We know what's going on in our clinic, but what's going on in Minnesota, what's going on in Texas. And so we have a three-part series that's coming out where we're looking at the effect of education, annual income, and different things. Like, do you have uh, an issue going to your pharmacy and other psychosocial issues and social determinants of health and how they impact patients with uveitis? So that one's going to be coming out in the next year. And we're also comparing the effectiveness of these new biologic medications, the new quote unquote generics, if you will, on the effect of the original medication like Remicade or Humira in treating eye inflammation. Finally, we wanna know how great artificial intelligence is for answering questions about uveitis. And so we're exploring that space. And I also wanna know who's not coming to clinic. And so we are looking into that and we are also trying to figure out other things that keep kids from coming back to our uveitis clinic, especially children with uh, juvenile sarcoid or uh, juvenile idiopathic arthritis. And so these are our burning questions in order to figure out, well, what's the demographic that I need to look out for? Is there a certain time of year that people might not show up more? And then how can I involve my social worker in order to make sure patients come to the clinic such as taxi vouchers, and also making sure the other strategies we found for affording medications are actually working in order to allow you to have a good quality of life and not feel like you're spending every waking minute or penny in the doctor's office. And my, I was in medical school and my mom used to clip out little cartoons and send them to me to try to make me chuckle. And this was one of my favorite ones that I kept on my, my fridge. And it says, I had a great time tonight. I'd like to see you again in four to six weeks. That's dating a doctor. And that's basically what you do with us for a really long-term care and management. And we like to think of us as a partner in your, your crusade against sarcoid. And I'm happy to answer questions. And, and thanks again for having me here tonight. Dr. Birkenstock, that was wonderful. Thank you so much for all of the information, suggestions, and more importantly, you know, the latest details on what's going on, you know, going forward. And uh, the things that are available. Um, I have gotten a couple questions that I wanted to uh, present to you if you had time to hang out with us. Sure, let's do it. Okay. Uh, first question is, um, one of our guests has sarcoidosis that was diagnosed with a biopsy. Enlarged lymph nodes were found in this person's chest area. Uh, the only thing affected so far is their their eyes. So the uveitis has been under control for over two years with Humira and a low dose of mexotrexate. Um, however, recently she, uh, this person has been experiencing joint pain that lasts from one to three days, then goes away, and then another joint is affected. Uh, this person's eye specialist sent, is sending this person to a rheumatologist on August 24th. Uh, this person's concerned that it could be lupus that's caused by the Humira. Any suggestions on uh, any suggestions other than what we have in the works seeing a rheumatologist? Yeah, I think that's that's your best option just to make sure that there's no sarcoid involvement in the joints. I mean, sometimes people develop antibodies to Humira. So that could be one thing that the uh, rheumatologist could check for, because even though it sounds like you're on a great regimen, there's other things in with medications, like I said, antibody formation that may make them less effective. And so you might have breakthrough new problems from the sarcoid in a different organ system, or you're right, you could have a drug-induced lupus 
this um, and then have a new onset of joint pain for that reason. But they need to look at you holistically. And I'm glad that your ophthalmologist did that because like I tell people, my, I'm really good with these little black boxes right here, but I haven't auscultated or listened to somebody's chest in a really long time, not let alone examine a joint. So I think the um, the, the gurus in that, that wheelhouse are the rheumatologists. So it sounds like you're going to be in really good hands and you just need a really good once over by the rheumatologist with some labs. Yeah. Let us know how that 24th date goes. <laughs> yeah. Um, the next question is, uh, what is the natural course of ocular sarcoidosis? Is there any way to prevent ocular sarcoidosis? It's a great question. And, and, and I think there's so many mysteries, right, about sarcoid and why does it go to the eye in one person and it doesn't in another? Right. And in a lot of patients, it's it, it the minority, it's it's a one-off thing where they get the uveitis and it goes away. But in, all, in most sarcoid patients, it becomes chronic. And if I knew how to prevent it, man, I, I'd be out there uh, stomping around, telling everybody. And I'm, there's just no good way other than... And, if you had sarcoid in another part of your body and you went on immunosuppression, the likelihood of eye involvement is, is much, much lower unless there's breakthrough inflammation, but there's really no way to prevent it. It's just making sure you're always screened for it. So that way, if it is there, it's caught early. Gotcha. Gotcha. Good suggestions. Um, next question is, uh, does, does having orbital socket complications increase the likelihood of also developing uveitis? It's a great question. And again, it's another one of the sarcoid mysteries is why certain parts of the eye are affected and, and others aren't. And in some patients with orbital inflammation from sarcoid, it just stays in the orbit and there's no problems. And then in rare cases, you have uveitis and orbital inflammation, but that's the minority of cases. So if it's usually just in the orbit, it tries to hang out there. And it's usually the lacrimal gland that makes the tears that's uh, preferentially affected in those cases. Is that the snowballs or the greasy oh, spots? Yeah, I know. That's uh, the both of those are uveitis. Yeah. Oh, so it's see? yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, there's so many spots. That's that's the key here. It's it's just so it's so crazy. Yeah. So um in, in the orbit, it would be like the orbital um fat. So like if you ever, God forbid, get pushed in the eye, there's like a little recoil. So the orbit is filled with fat and and soft tissues to kind of cushion around the eye. And that, in addition to the, the gland around the, the eyeball, that's that's what get inflamed in, in orbital inflammation. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. So let's mm -hmm. stay on that. Um, the next question is, uh, one of our guests has been getting random blurry vision. It's likely, it's like looking through water. What mm -hmm. are the signs of in the eyes? Oh, that's a great question. So, um, the tip of the iceberg could be that the eyes are dry because of Sjogren's syndrome or dry eye from inflammation on the eye surface and the parts of the eye that make the tears. But you should really see somebody, um, an ophthalmologist, in order to make sure that there's no inflammation inside the eye. One thing that can make the eye feel like it's looking through water is if there's swelling in the retina. And then the retina can't process what is seen um, in the eye because of the fluid that's there and it makes things look rippled and it gives you waves um, and it just distorts the vision. And so if you're having that, you should be making sure that there's no signs of uveitis and other things to look out for would be redness, pain, um, lots of floaters in the eye. So little black dots going by flashes of light, like a strobe light going off. So those are other things. We're just looking hazy, like there's smoke in the room, but there is no smoke. So right. all of those things could be, um, uveitis. Now you may have just mentioned this, but, um, the next question is, is does sarcoidosis cause dry eye? Yes, it definitely does. And it's a, it's a common cause of it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, which sarcoidosis medications uh, should we be most mindful of in regard to future eye complications? Okay. So um, if you're taking medications, certain things that can affect the eye, like secondary side effects of the medication in the eye. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. So Plaquenil, if your doctor is still recommending Plaquenil, you need to have screening once a year for the first seven years. 
And then after that, it's usually every six months because the risk of the plaque window building up in the support cells underneath your retina, the part that helps you see in the back of the eye goes up. It's about 3% at seven years. And then it kind of goes up like a, like a ramp after that. And so one thing that you need is plaque window screening and your rheumatologist should remind you about that. Other medications that affect the eye, oddly enough, Humira and Remicade have been associated with eye inflammation by themselves, even though in most patients, it stops eye inflammation. And so if you're that one-off person who has that rare complication and you're doing just fine and then your doctor starts you on those medications or over time, you notice your vision's not right, go see an ophthalmologist. And so those are really the medications that are going to have some kind of effect in the eye, either good or bad, or need to be monitored. Okay. Great. Awesome. Um, Next question is, how do you decrease external uh, edema of the eye? Mm, Good question. So if the lids are involved and they're swollen traditionally we use, and it's non-infectious. So we roll that part out. Then um, we, we use steroids. Um, if the cornea is swollen, there are special eye drops to try to suck the fluid out. Um, and so those are called Muro drops, M-U-R-O. They are over the counter um, and they come in two or 5% varieties. So sometimes people with corneal swelling will get those. Um, and then normally if like the conjunctiva or the sclera is inflamed outside parts of the eye, then we'll use corticosteroids or NSAIDs. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, are contacts harmful to the eyes uh, of a sarcoidosis patient? No, by themselves. No, it's a great question. Um, but if you are on topical steroid medications, we're a little leery of them because there's a higher risk of infection because the steroid will decrease your immune system's effect around the eye. So we usually shy away from contact lenses unless you're at two or less drops of a steroid a day. And then what we do to even further lower the risk is say, put the drop in, wait 15 minutes, then put your contact lenses in. And then at the end of the day, after you only wear them for eight hours, that's the after school special here, eight hours and use re-wetting drops with them. Then you take them out and wait 15 minutes and put your other steroid in and don't sleep in them. <laughs> Don't sleep in it. That's the big one. <laughs> um, fantastic. Um, let me see. The next question is, um, what should we do if if we are looking for a new optimo- uh, ophthalmologist? I think I said that right. Oh yeah, uh, perfect. Yes. So someone's looking for a new a new person. What are the characteristics or the the, the things that they should look at quality wise? And you mm-hmm. mentioned earlier about certain uh, places in the country that may not have a certain specialist and everything like that. So what mm-hmm. would you recommend to pursue or to outline? Yeah, it's a great question. So, um, like I said, there's just not enough of us. So if you have a local provider that's close by that you can actually get to or get transportation to get to, that's that's the first bullet point. But um, if you can come see a uveitis specialist, if you have uveitis, another study that I didn't mention that we're doing is trying to figure out if time from when you start having inflammation to when you see one of us, if that affects your risk for having a low vision outcome. And so we're, we're really facile with the drugs. We understand what your um, rheumatologist is doing. We use the same drugs they do. And so we prescribe them ourselves and monitor your own labs. If you need us to go it alone, meaning say you only have inflammation in your eye. Well, that's fine. I can send you to the rheumatologist, like the other patient who uh, asked a question, but I can take care of you, um, in the meantime. So that's one bonus of having a uveitis specialist. Plus we're used to long-term care. And, um, sometimes it's, it's hard to find a UVI specialist, but if you can find an ophthalmologist with an open spot, that's also key these days because the return to care has been pretty epic for us, just like primary care providers. I don't know how it is where you guys are, but here in Maryland, it's it's a several month wait for you to establish care with the primary care provider because a lot either retired, left the profession, went concierge, and some ophthalmologists do the same thing. And so what I what I would tell people are 
find somebody who's close by. So you're not in the car all the time. Find somebody who you can trust and develop a long-term relationship with. If you do have the uveitis and it's not going away and they're trying to taper steroid drops or they're talking to you about injections, try to see a uveitis specialist if you have one nearby. Um, and again, go see somebody who's treated UV, uh, uveitis patients and specifically people with sarcoid before. Fantastic. A little earlier in your presentation, you mentioned the value of um, keeping track of things, you know, and having a system. And so with the, the Life and Breath Foundation has actually developed a sarcoidosis planner and the sarcoidosis planner actually would allow a patient to track their diagnosis, their journey, their habits, deposit medical records and documents and notes and so this is something we just put together. Um, we, we uh, I think, out, uh, launched it in March. Uh, we're providing this for free, either in a paper form or digitally, digitally um, through our website. But could you talk about the value of that? You mentioned it earlier, but maybe the value of having a tool like this to be able to have everything in one spot and then to be able to go back and reference or to even the value of being able to show your medical professional, here's where I am, here's what they said the last time, or this specialist said this, this specialist said that, you know, the value as, as, a, as a physician, you know, being on the receiving end, interacting with patients. That's amazing. Speaking of quality improvement initiatives, that is awesome because I can tell you when you sit in my chair all day, how nice it is for people to bring things in. As I say, on a silver platter, I hardly ever get records on time from another doctor's office. Lord knows they're busy doing other things like, oh, I don't know, seeing patients. Yeah. And so I don't get, get the referral note. And I'm kind of like, well, what's going on? And the patient's like, well, I can't see it. I'm like, well, how long is this going on? And what else have you been up to lately? Well, I saw this specialist, but I forget what they told me. So to have that all in one spot and your labs, oh, I would die for a set of labs some days yeah. Yeah. to know what other physicians did because I don't want to have to get you poked and take your blood again if somebody already did it, right? Why reinvent the wheel? And if you have everything at your disposal in your fingertips, and also you have your doctor's phone number. So that way when it's Friday at 4 p.m. and I want to get a hold of your GP to say, is it okay with their diabetes that I can start corticosteroids because I'm not sure what their A1C is? Wow, yeah. that would be awesome. And also a medical list is helpful. Sometimes I don't get one of those and I don't want to cause an interaction with your other drugs. So I love what you did. That 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 would be like physician's best friend. It, it's awesome. It sounds like an endorsement to me. I think it's <laughs> Sign me well, up. We're we're gonna we're gonna continue. The best part of this uh, tracker is this is for mm -hmm. the patient. This is a bible for the patient to be able to be their own advocate, to be able to be better prepared when they come in and see you. Like you just mentioned, they can have everything in one spot and be able to refer to it. And we think that they can get more out of the visit that way. And and you probably will get more out of it also. Um, so that's fantastic. Um, I'm glad you like it. Again, you can find that on our website, uh, lifefrombreath.org. Uh, I'll send it to you for free or I'll send you the link. I just would love to have some feedback on how you're using it. Is it making a difference? Things of that nature. Um, so it looks like we've developed three more questions. So that's yep. great. Um, I'm glad we're having more activity. So we have one guest that says um, she has had sarcoidosis for 22 years in multiple organs, including her eyes. The inflammation in the eyes externally and have low vision. How can I address the inflammation in my eyes? It's a great question. And so um, it sounds crazy, but we're just like real estate uh, professionals, location, location, location. And so if it's in the front of your eye, Topical steroids are the way to go unless you can't get down to that magical two drops or less per day. Then the uh, physician needs to start talking about immunosuppression. Um, so again, the methotrexates, the humeros of the world. And if those are already on board for your other involvement um, in the body, then 
it's maybe a talk of, well, maybe it's not working as much. Like maybe it's working great for your skin and your lungs, but not so much for the eyes and maybe finding a medication that can work for all parts of you, which is always the hardest part in, in doctoring, right? Making sure the entire person is taken care of. So that would be something to consider. And if it's in the back of the eye, the inflammation that is, you could either do injections and steroids in the back of the eye or around the eye. Um, and then also, like I said, other medications, um, to change for immunosuppression, because like I said, low vision, it, you want to keep what you have. Sometimes we can't get back what we've lost. Like if there's glaucomatous loss, um, but we sure as heck can keep what we have. And that would be the goal here. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Um, the next, uh, guest, um, indicates that her eyesight has become quite bad. Uh, it goes in cycles that seem to correspond with her flare-ups. Uh, you know, she can barely see um, at times. And then when she goes and sees the doctor, the doctor says, hey, your eyesight hasn't changed. Um, and they said that she has cataracts. Have you seen this before? Yeah, exactly. And and one thing, um, and I don't know if you're in, on infusions or not, but one thing that I see or Humira or it, whenever your drug starts to wear off, that's when you're most likely to flare, right? So like if you're taking Remicade um, infusions every four weeks and at the third week, that's when your vision starts to get blurry and you see your physician the first week after you get your infusion, they're going to think, oh, everything's great. Everything's wonderful. You're doing great. You stay on your Medicaid. I'll see you in four months. And in the meantime, you're starting to lose your vision and your cataracts getting worse. Now, sometimes cataracts just get worse on their own. I mean, age is one thing that we can't stop, right? And so cataracts get worse with time. But if you're having inflammation that's happening between when you see your physician, so when you're having these episodes, call in and be like, look, I need a same day appointment. I'm a uveitis patient, like take me now. Um, so they can see you and assess things because if it's just cataract alone, cataracts shouldn't get really terrible, really quickly. So that means there's something else afoot. There's something else at play here because cataracts get worse over the time period of months to years, not just days. And they shouldn't fluctuate. They're there. They cause um, blurriness and clouding of the vision. But like I said, it, it sounds like, especially if it's correlating with flares, you might be under treated systemically or somebody's just missing you right when that flare happens. Mm, yeah, that could be it. Definitely. Can uveitis be hidden on a visual exam, but patient is symptomatic with blurred vision, eye pain, light sensitivity on an oral pregnisone for lung, skin, sark? Wow. And the question was, can pregnisone mask what the ophthalmologist sees? Absolutely. And it depends on the dose. So like if you're started at a high dose for the other organ systems, we're going to deceptively, again, think, oh, the eye is fine. You're doing great. You just taper and then we'll see you later. And then, you know, you get down to 20 because you always flare at 20, right? I hear that story a lot. And then, you know, the ophthalmologist is like, oh, wait, yeah, there it is. You know, so it's, it's all timing and location um, for inflammation. So unless they dilate you, you could also have inflammation that's being missed because you ask if, can it be hidden? Yeah, it could be hidden in the back of the eye if the provider doesn't look in the back of your eye. So you should have a dilated eye exam. So sometimes we'll miss maybe swelling in the back of the eye because we think, oh, the front of the eye looks great, but we don't see the macular edema that's causing you to lose your vision in the back if we don't look. Mm. Interesting. Do you have any suggestions for vitamins or diets to help rid of inflammation? Yeah, it's a great question. I get this a lot when I practice in California um, and even for my own autoimmune things, which is why I do uveitis. Um, not that I have uveitis, but I get you all. Um, I have tried it myself. Some folks feel that anti-inflammatory diet. So basically things without preservatives, which in the American diet is really, really hard, right? And some people also say things, uh, getting rid of things like alcohol, chocolate, any kind of caffeine. So basically eating organic and eating um, just very cleanly, if you will, um, that will decrease basically being vegan will decrease inflammation in the body because there's a thought that there's a link between the gut biome. So the bacteria in your gut 
and autoimmune disease. And they're finding more and more correlations with that, that there's some kind of overlap or mimicry of their bacteria in the gut and parts of the body. And so that's one thought. It's not been proven, but it's a thought and it's an area of research. And so I tell my patients, look, (laughs) in America these days, if you want to be vegan and you want to cut out all that stuff, you're doing better than most people. Okay. So getting rid of the refined and processed foods. I mean, I feel like we all could, could benefit from that in in certain ways. And so it's not going to hurt you and it might, it might make you feel better. I mean, I personally felt better, but again, there's no long-term studies. There's no clinic um, quality or controlled studies with placebos or anything like that. I can't put you in a padded room and only feed you spinach and somebody else gives big Macs. you know, we'll, we'll never have those studies. I can tell you incidentally that some people it works for, some people it doesn't. I think holistically as a physician, I love hearing these things about how these these diets work um, and what you would be eating and not eating. But um, that's what I I encourage my patients to try it. Yeah. Wow. Looks like I have one more for you. And this is more wanting your opinion and kind of trying to figure out what is the truth. Um, So this young lady has sarcoidosis in the lymph system, lungs, uh, testing for kidneys, but also an MRI of the brain and optic nerve next week. And it was ordered by a sarcoidosis specialist. And uh, she's going to be seeing a neurologist also in September. Um, seeing an ophthalmologist yesterday, uh, the ophthalmologist said um, the eye looks good and shouldn't need an MRI of the optic nerve. Specialist says ophthalmologists couldn't see the back part of the optic nerve. What is the truth? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So the optic nerve is several inches long. I see the two millimeters in the front of it. So like I said, it looks like a glazed donut and that's the part that I see. That's the most forward part of the optic nerve. So that's what I look at to see if there's glaucoma damage. If there's like, remember when I showed you the picture, it, it looks chalky and lumpy when I could see if there's granulomas there. And that's called the optic nerve head, but the rest of the optic nerve body is stuck in the eye socket because it's the cable between the eye and the brain. So the part that leaves the back of the eye and goes all the way back into the brain and forms um, the the little tracks of of cells that um, then lead to the part of the brain that processes what we see, that I can't see um, because without neuroimaging, in this case, an MRI or sometimes a CT, but MRI is better. Um, I, I can't see that part of the optic nerve. So for what the ophthalmologist can see, those two millimeters, everything looks great. But then there's several other inches that could be imaged with the MRI. So if your neurologist is suspecting something or even just wants to rule out other involvement of sarcoid because of maybe some of your other symptoms, and reasons why I would order an MRI for someone would be changes in color vision, double vision, pain in the eye socket, pain with moving the eye around in different directions. Those would be reasons to do it. Mm-hmm. Well, Dr. Birkenstock, this has been a treat and so informative. And I, I really appreciate you taking the time to answer a lot of those questions and and really give uh, the patients an opportunity just to get some some you know questions answered, a different opinion from an expert, especially one that works at Hopkins and is well regarded and everything. We're just we're very happy that you were able to join us tonight and really supporting the efforts of the Life and Breath Foundation. But we would love to have you back. Uh, we gl- we're glad that you came back and everything. But um, maybe I I give you the last words if there's anything you wanted to part with with any of our guests tonight. Yeah, no, thank you very much for having me. And thank you for everything you do to support the patients in their journeys. And I really, really love what you've done so far. These webinars are extraordinarily helpful, having them find a way to organize things. I mean, it's great. It's it's tough being a patient and I don't think doctors say that enough. And you're making that journey a little bit easier. And it's a journey a lot of people, as we know, don't want to be on and they just need to know that people care and are with them. And we're certainly with them and I'm glad you are too. Well, thank you so much. We couldn't do it without you and it's a great partnership. And um, we're again, thank you for, for joining us this evening and thank you to all of you who joined live. Uh, this evening. We, we appreciate the participation and 
Uh, we look forward to seeing you again very soon. Also, I wanted to share uh, in a closing matter that we are, and again, in our efforts to support uh, the patients, we're starting a support group. Um, it's going to be August the 24th at 8 p.m. We have a wonderful couple that is going to help lead and guide uh, discussions centered around an exchange of information. We really don't want it to be a uh, you know negative uh, experience. We really want it to be a positive one. And so we're going to take a look at seeing how we can do that on the 24th of August. And we'll put some more information on the website uh, to be able to help people understand uh, if they wanted to attend. But this evening, I'd like to say good night. Dr. Birkenstock, thank you so much again. And I wish you well and enjoy the rest of your summer. Thank you.